sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Hallelujah. Sing ye heaven's hour reply. If you're a guest this morning, thanks for coming out to be with us. I hope you enjoyed a great breakfast with us or brunch, depending on whether you're a Christian or not. So really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. We have a special service planned for today. Um, there will be singing. There will be reflection on Scripture. There will be Scripture reading. And then later in this service, we will celebrate, as we do every Sunday, what we call communion or the Lord's Supper, or in some churches, the Eucharist. It's a time of symbolically gathering around the Lord's table and sharing bread and wine, which represents the body and blood of Jesus. We do that every Sunday, but it feels a little bit more special today because we're not just celebrating that, we're celebrating the awesome resurrection as well. Let me invite you to stand. I want to share a scripture with you as we get started, and this is from Psalm 107. Hear the word of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Amen. Who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do? Who could ever be more faithful, true? I will trust in you, I will trust in you, my God. There is a fountain, who is a king, victorious warrior and lord of everything. My rock, my shelter, my very own, blessed Redeemer, who reigns upon the throne. My rock, my shelter, my very own, blessed Redeemer, who reigns upon the throne. could comfort me and love me like you do, who could ever be more faithful, true? I will trust in you, I will trust in you, my God. There is a fountain, who is a king, victorious warrior, and Lord of
A recurring theme in our effort to read, to be in the Word in 2018, to read through the entire Scripture as a church this year, a recurring theme is the idea that the Bible tells a single story, a cohesive, overarching narrative that leads ultimately to the cross, the tomb, and to the resurrection of Jesus. It's hard to remember that. We sometimes get so focused on the individual pixels that we fail to see the image they combine to create. We can obsess over a note in a song and miss the music, or we can lock in on a brush stroke in a painting and fail to see the beauty, the tree, not see the forest. And then you run across a passage or even a word in a passage and connections to the larger narrative of the Bible light up the neurons in your brain like fireworks. You read a word, and suddenly, instead of seeing a single strand of meaning, you see the network. Instead of an island, you see the continent. Something like that happens in Joshua chapter 4, the book that we're working our way through now on other Sunday mornings. I want you to listen to the first nine verses with me. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men that he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. And he said to them, go over before the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You tell them, that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. And so the Israelites did as Joshua had commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. So given what we gave you when you came in this morning, I suspect you already know the word that we're going to focus on, stones. You ever thought about how many times in the Bible that word shows up? When Jesus encountered Satan in the wilderness, Satan tempted him to turn stones into bread. When the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, Jesus said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, a thing my mother wanted me to remind you of today when you received these. When he entered Jerusalem to the praise of the people, the religious leaders told him to tell them to stop. And Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Peter wrote to his church, you like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. Just an avalanche of passages tumbles through your mind when you read Joshua 4 and you see the word stones. Joshua imagines a moment in the future when an Israelite and her children are walking by this stone monument and the children see the stones and suddenly a walk to the river turns into a teaching moment. The children ask probably pretty much the same question we asked this morning when we walked in. What do these stones mean? And the parent tells the story of how God miraculously led Israel from a life of pitching tents and digging graves in the desert through a river, to a promise fulfilled. It's Easter morning. Let you and I take a walk through the landscape of Scripture, but not as grown-ups with all the answers. Let's go as children 
And when we see a stone, let's ask, what does this stone mean? We'll take our offering as we sing this next song. I'm nothing less And Jesus love and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus love and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame not the first time stones are mentioned in the Bible, but in Genesis 28, Jacob is a marked man. He's on the run from a broken family and his brother Esau, who has vowed to kill him. Moses writes that when Jacob came to a certain place, he stopped for the night, and taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. It was a hard pillow, but he slept. And he dreamed of a stairway to heaven. And the angels of God were going up and down that stairway. And at the top stood God. And in the dream, God spoke. He repeated the promise that he had given Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, that he would have descendants so numerous they would outnumber the dust of the earth, that his descendants would possess the land one day that he was now sleeping on, and that all people on earth would be blessed through Jacob's offspring. And then God said something that a man running for his life, a man who had made some serious mistakes probably needed to hear, maybe even something you need to hear today. God said, Genesis 28, 15, I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. When he woke up, Jacob thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And he set up a stone, the stone that had been his pillow, as a monument. And he called that place Beth El, the house of God. What does this stone mean? It means that God is present. It means that there is, as Walter Brueggemann says, traffic between heaven and earth. It means that we are not left to lie alone in the hard beds we have made for ourselves. It means that heaven and its resources are not remote and are not inaccessible. Perhaps the stone you hold in your hand this morning can be a reminder that you are not alone, that surely the Lord is in this place, that God is, as he promised Jacob, with you 
and will watch over you wherever you go. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. Genesis 28, Jacob was on the run. In Exodus 17, his descendants, now as numberless as the sands of the sea or the stars in the sky, were on the move. But the land through which they were moving was an unwelcoming place called the wilderness. You and I know from watching episodes of Planet Earth that even where there appears to be no chance for life, Life thrives. But the people of Israel had never heard the reassuring narration of David Attenborough. They were hot, and they were thirsty, and they were tired, and they were surly, and they were hopeless. Exodus 17.3 says that they did what hot and tired and thirsty and surly and hopeless people do. They grumbled. Verse 7 says... They quarreled, and they doubted the very thing that we just talked about, whether the Lord was with them. They said, is the Lord among us or not? It was a rhetorical question. They didn't think he was. When you are wandering aimlessly through what to all appearances is a God-forsaken land, the wilderness becomes not so much a place as a season of life or a state of mind. And you may be in one of your own wildernesses this morning yourself. So God told Moses to go stand by the rock at a place named Horeb. The name means desolate. It comes from the root word, the Hebrew root word for drought. It sounds dry. It sounds hopeless. 
and lifeless. It sounds like the kind of place where movements and marriages and families and faith go to die. There's no connection, but Horeb and Horrible sound like they come from the same linguistic family. Strike the rock, God told Moses. Strike the rock at this place called Horrible. And water will come out of it for the people to drink. Moses did. The water came. The people drank. What does this stone mean? It means that God provides. It means that there is grace in the wilderness of consequences. There is forgiveness in the wilderness of failure. There is comfort in the wilderness of grief. It means that while you can't always get what you want, a song by the stones, <laughs> with God, you get the provision you need. Maybe the stone you hold in your hand this morning is there to remind you that no matter what wilderness you find yourself in, God will provide. Let's stand. Promise maker, promise keeper, you finish what you another stone in 1 Samuel 7, and this one actually has a name, Ebenezer. Here's the story. Israel had been estranged from the Lord for a long, long time, over two decades. Finally, when they were tired of living with the consequences of that estrangement, they turned back to the Lord. Samuel, their prophet, told them that if they were serious 
There were certain things that they were going to have to rid themselves of, which didn't come as a surprise to them and shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Any, any time we turn to the Lord or turn back to the Lord, there are always going to be habits that have to be replaced, values that have to be raised, behaviors that have to be reconsidered. So they all assembled in a town, the town of Mizpah, and they confessed their sin. But just when it seemed like everything was going to be okay again, word came that their enemies, the Philistines, were marching against them in a panic. They said to Samuel, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us. And then Samuel did what in our culture is a, an odd thing, a needlessly violent thing. We would even think a cruel thing. He took a lamb. The Bible says it was a suckling lamb, a lamb that had not yet been weaned. He took that lamb and he killed it. He sacrificed it to God. And then the Bible says that Samuel cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered. God routed the Philistines, and at the place where God had defeated their enemies, Samuel set up a stone as a monument, and he named that stone Ebenezer. And the name Ebenezer means, the Lord has helped us. What does this stone mean? It means that the Lord hears and answers when we call. It means that the Lord delivers when we are in danger. But it reminds us that that deliverance comes at a cost, one we cannot afford to pay. The deliverance, the stone that Samuel set up, was bought with the life of a lamb. And you cannot see the word lamb on any page of Scripture without thinking of Jesus. Isaiah prophesied that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Peter said that we were bought with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, or defect. In the Revelation, people from every tribe and language and nation bow before the Lamb because He was slain and with His blood He purchased people for God. What, what does this stone mean this morning? Let it remind you that the Lord has come to help. Let it remind you that the Lord delivers. As we share this bread, let it remind you of his body. And as we share the cup, let it remind you of his blood. Let's pray together. Holy Father, there are as many meanings attached to the stones we hold as there are people in this room. For some of us, this stone means your presence. That's what we need most right now. For others of us, this stone means Provision, because there are places in our lives where we are dying of thirst and starving and we need your provision. But God, for every single one of us, this stone could be named Ebenezer because it reminds us that you came to help us. You came to deliver us. And you did that completely, eloquently, eternally on the cross of Jesus. God, we, we want to celebrate. We want to celebrate the resurrection. But first, we need to come to the cross and we need to see the body and know that it was broken for us. We thank you for this bread which represents the body of our Lord as we share it May we remember and honor him.
In Jesus' name. soldiers led Jesus into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with the staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, when they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, that is, the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the land until three in the afternoon. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with vinegar, put it on a staff, offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, they said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Father, thank you for preserving that story. And yet we are sorry that that story had to be preserved. It is the story of the Lamb who was slain for us. And we regret that our sin necessitated his death. But we are so grateful. You have torn the curtain 
between where you are and where we were. And you have made a way for us through the body and through the blood of Jesus. Thank you for this cup, this symbol that represents this horrible, violent moment in history, but the most important moment ever because it's when you made a way for us through him. As we receive this cup, may we remember in Jesus' name, amen. One final stone. We read about this one in Mark's Gospel. Late in the afternoon, since it was the day of preparation, that is, Sabbath Eve, Joseph of Arimathea, a highly respected member of the Jewish council, came. He was one who lived expectantly, on the lookout for the kingdom of God. 
Working up his courage, he went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate questioned whether he could be dead that soon and called for the captain to verify that he was really dead. Assured by the captain, he gave Joseph the corpse. Having already purchased a linen shroud, Joseph took him down, wrapped him in the shroud, placed him in a tomb that had been cut from the rock, rolled a large stone across the opening. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, watched the burial. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they could embalm him. Very early on Sunday morning, as the sun rose, they went to the tomb. They worried out loud to each other, who will roll back the stone from the tomb from us? Grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose, he arose, a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, he arose, he arose, he arose hallelujah, Christ arose. Who has held the oceans in his hand? Oh, 
nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Crown Him with many crowns, the Lamb upon His throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but His own. Awake, my soul, and see. Until the next time we do it again. Have a great day. Happy Easter. Easter egg hunt. <laughs> Meet in the fellowship hall, Easter egg hunt. <laughs>